And so why don't we go ahead and open the meeting at 6.03. And look at this. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Perfect attendance. All nine trustees on. Um, I guess we need to do our roll call. Uh, I will call the name and then you say your full name out loud, okay? And that way there won't be confusion. Uh, Carolyn Coffey. Steve? Stephen Brown. Catherine O'Callaghan. <laughs> Catherine O'Callaghan. Catherine H. <laughs> Catherine Harvey. Sarah. Oh, you got to unmute. Sarah Pease. Megan B. Here, uh, Megan Princy. Lynn. Lynn DiGiacomo. Mary Lou. Mary Lou Lawrence. Elaine. Breslow. Thank you. Um, uh, so the first uh, item for business would be um, approving the minutes from our last meeting. Did anyone have any questions or comments? I don't even remember them. I read them so long ago. I had one question and I don't know whether this is appropriate or not, but we had in the minutes that we were going to try to add, um, get help to the, uh, oh, yeah. to the library uh, website. And when I just checked it, it's not there yet, but maybe it's inappropriate. I'm sorry. What were we going to put on there? Um, a resource. What, what are the local resources to folks that are struggling for child care for education for supplementary income etc yes yes that website that you sent out i apologize yeah we'll get that on the website slip my mind i've actually i think i've i don't know if i had seen it before um or something like it um it's excellent so yes we need to add it to the website i will do that good thanks it's important um thank you were there any other questions or comments and if not could i please have a motion to approve so moved. Second. Second. Um, I think for the minutes we can just do an all in favor. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are passed. Um, lead the way, Megan. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'll share my screen. We have had a pretty wild month this month. I'm going to go a little bit out of order. <laughs> because I think it's important for contacts to kind of know what we have signed ourselves up for so that um, there's kind of an understanding of, we still have a lot going on, but um, not generally as much as we normally do. And so um, about two weeks ago, uh, so uh, through the whole pandemic, I've been part of the emergency management calls on Thursday mornings. Um, so most of the time I'm listening in and just sharing a lot of the services that we're providing ongoing. Um, and in my last OCLN meeting um, that I was in, Sandwich Public Library was talking about how um, backed up their health department was in Sandwich from all the calls about being um, about the vaccine and people just being excited and confused and really wanting to share their stories and their frustrations. Um, and health departments, you know, are not generally staffed for a pandemic. So our health department in Cohasset has been working extremely hard and I'm very impressed with them um, setting up clinics and, you know, ongoing through the pandemic, having to do a lot of different, um, wearing a lot of different hats. Um, so um, once the vaccine came out, not only was the health department inundated, but um, elder services was inundated with calls as well with people who, um, needed some help or just needed somebody to chat with about some of their anxieties that they were having about the vaccine and the health and the elder services weren't able to get any of their work done besides, you know, chatting with folks most of the day. Um, so I reached out to them and offered um, the library's staff uh, during the afternoons um, to help um, staff the hotline to alleviate some of the pressure from the other departments. Um, the library staff was happy to do it or is happy to do it. They've volunteered their, um, vo they all volunteered to do it. Um, and then, uh, oh, what was it last? No, it was this week it started. Um, there was some need for uh, calling some of our folks who are 75 plus who have pre-registered uh, for an appointment in Cohasset. 
um, to call each individual and um, who have been selected for this week and schedule an appointment for them. So we get 100 doses a week. So we had 100 people to call and schedule for Thursday's clinic. Uh, so we split the the um, we split the list with elder services. And so we've been calling folks to make sure that they have an appointment. Um, it's been an incredible experience and I'm really excited that we could be a part of helping out. Um, so we've been uh, working on some things that aren't 100% li library related, but is of course uh, number one priority and we're really proud to be a part of it. So um, as I go through my report, it's a little, um, less dense this month, but uh, we've been making calls and chatting with people and reaching out and it's been a really, uh, it's been really great for the library and it's been really great for the town to get these people in line. Megan, can I ask a question? Do you need um, any volunteers from the trustees for um, these calls to be made? Because I'm happy to help. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me reach out to the health department and just see. I know they're like very cautious about the, as they should be, the link that people that we're using to um, book people's appointments. They just don't right. want a lot of people to have that link. Um, but we definitely need help. So <laughs> let me, um, let me just put my feelers out. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Um, let me just ask, um, what their feelings are on, on volunteers. But yeah, we would really appreciate that, Megan. And I have to tell you, it's a really, it's a, it's an uplifting experience. Selfishly, it's, people are so excited to talk to you and um, <laughs> just thrilled to be moving forward. And it's, it's, it's really a great call to make. So. Yeah, I'd um, be happy to help. Great. Okay. Um, all right. I'll, um, I'll ask. Well. That's wonderful. Great. And okay. me. Yay. <laughs> We could start like a whole trustee hotline. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so uh, also um, another bragging point is that Bronwyn volunteered and was chosen to help run the clinic. So we've lost Bronwyn a little bit over the last two weeks, but we're super, super proud of her. I actually can't see her on my screen, so I can't look at you, but we're super, super proud of her and um, she was one of a Bronwyn, maybe five or six folks in town who were selected. She's nodding. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> um, I think there's um, five of us. Good. So it just shows, you know, that obviously Bronwyn's such an asset to town and they recognize that she can easily pick things up and mm -hmm. that um, she could be flexible as well and she's easy to work with. So. Um, huge compliment um, to Bronwyn for being chosen, and um, so we're we're without her a little bit, but for good reason. So, all right. So on to library items. Does anybody have any questions about the hotline or anything? Just even if you have friends that are interested or something, anything. No. Okay. I'm curious as to how I know a lot of folks were um, trying to get relatives to be vaccinated at the elder center, even though they didn't live in Cohasset. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so unfortunately, if you don't live in Cohasset, then you, you aren't able to get a shot um, through us. Um, we only get 100 doses a week, so we're really focused on our own residents. Um, and as of right now too, Governor Baker came out today and announced that if you're a caretaker of somebody over 75, that you can get a vaccine as well. Um, our town, most all towns are not honoring that. That's more for a lot of like the bigger Gillette, Fenway, the, the um, uh, Marshfield Fair um, would be honoring that, but we just simply don't, we're just not getting enough doses to be able to, to do that. We really need to get all of our 75 plus people in, which is going to take us a little bit a while. Um, so, um, but so really proud of um, being a part of the Cohasset team on this. They're doing an amazing job. They were ready. Um, as soon as the vaccine was coming out, they were ready to run a clinic three days a week and do 600, um, administer 600 vaccines a week. Um, they had it all planned and ready to go to only find out that they were only receiving 100. Um, so they had to pare it way down. But 
they were re- they were ready to go and they still are, but um, they were ready to take on a lot. So you should be really proud of your community leadership here. Megan, do you know how many um, town residents are 75 and o- older? Uh, what did they say? Like, I think they said like in the 700s because it was gonna take seven to eight weeks. Yeah. Um, it's only 400. Oh, only 400. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's taking a while to reach everyone. And, um, and make their appointments. So I thought they thought at least a month before they get through that layer. A lot of the people over 75 have gotten vaccinated elsewhere. Yes. I'm finding that while I'm making my calls that people have gone elsewhere. Um, it's, and, and we are saying to people, if you are you know, able to go elsewhere, that's wonderful because we're so limited with our doses. Um, you know, we have so many folks in town that just, they can't make it to Gillette. It's just not reasonable for them. So if the folks that can make it to Gillette, to Gillette or somewhere else um, do, that's wonderful. Um, one thing we found in helping out folks is that if you have a physician uh, at uh, Beth Israel or MGH, you need to sign up to Patient Gateway where they will notify you that there are doses available in Pembroke. Oh, okay. And we is were able that to... um, um, Beth Israel in Plymouth as well? Um, no, it's, it's well, Pembroke, very close to Plymouth. Okay. It's right where, um, I think it's 123 crosses route three. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, people are starting to be contacted by their um, PCPs as well, which is good. If you can long. ask folks when they call in, you know, we've had a lot of older folks in the neighborhood who could be invited, but aren't using patient gateway, which is the vehicle by which people are being notified. Well, it's hard that all of this is on the internet and there's just folks that it's just not their thing. So, um, mm-hmm. so that's been hard. But, and 211, um, you know about 211. Two one one, yes, yes. Megan, how are you getting the people who are seventy five and older? Is it they have to pre register? Yes, so they have to pre register. Also, Elder Services has a fairly decent list of um, the folks in town as well. Um, Another thing, so um, also a lot of well, not only Elder Services, but uh, EMTs have. contact information for homebound residents as well. So um, perhaps that paramedics are going to those folks' homes to vaccinate them. There's three that have signed up to do that. So again, really impressive that everybody's just jumped in and um, doing gotta their best love to living get in Mayberry. Huh? I said, you gotta love living in Mayberry. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah. the other thing I, I was told and I, and is seems to be true accurate is that if you go to the town website and you click on the banner at the top which says you know covid information even though you may not be part of you know phase 1 a b c or d or whatever um, you can still register mm-hmm. um, because the town is hoping to collect enough data so that they can send it to the state to say look we have x amount of people that really would be interested and need the vaccine so can you please send us more so in a way i think they're doing it for that reason and also maybe down the line once we're up to you know phase three or whatever they they know they have contact information for people so you can go there and register and probably no harm in doing that as well yeah i know i've registered (laughs) do you think that people need help registering i mean maybe that's something that the trustees could do is offer, you know, to help people that, um, you know, don't have laptops or need help. I mean, I'm happy to help people register people too. Yeah, that would be, that's great. Um, we have people calling the hotline to register. So maybe that's something, um, uh, when I'm a little, um, trying to reach out to people, like, we're, of course it's on, you know, and Mary Lou always talks about this as well, but you know, it's online, it's on websites, it's on Facebook, it's on this, you know, but like, how are these folks who are not on the computer know to pre-register? 
and a lot of them I have noticed, like I chat with a lot of children of um, folks. And so that's how they, but not, not all people have, you know, their kids, you know, taking care of them or whatever it is, or they're by themselves. So, you know, that's the piece that I'm not sure how we, you know, reach those, reach those people. So, you know, if you have any neighbors or you know anybody around you that you're not sure, you know, would get, be getting the information, that's, you know, a great use of, you know, volunteer time as well as going out and just trying, talking to people and trying to identify if there's anybody in town who's uh, being missed. I, I don't know why we can't use like the reverse 911, you know, the connect ed system that, you know, when there's to be a snowstorm. So if we know who those residents are that are above the age of 75, let's say in this instance, why couldn't we, you know, have the town call, leave a message and say, please call us directly. Here's the number. And then we get, you know, whoever's, whoever's answering that hotline can register those people. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'll, uh, I'll mention that in my meeting tomorrow about the reverse 911. I mean, even, you know, there's folks who are under 75 who may not be in touch with town news as well. So um, I think that's a great idea, a great way of contacting people. We, we also have the town voters list, which has everybody's birth year on it. And so the town does have a list of <laughs> all the old people. Yes, we do. <laughs> We've had to use it a few times to check to check to see how, <laughs> what somebody's date they've submitted, which has been funny. Um, yes, we have that as well. So, uh, you know, I'm only in on the Thursday meetings in the morning. They have meetings every day and they're all always connected. So, you know, these ideas could have already been put out and for some reason didn't come to fruition, but I will, um, I will mention it tomorrow and um, see, see what they say. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Not always in the full no. <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on. So, um, the big thing that I've worked on this month is, uh, receiving some quotes for people counters, which is something that we started last year. Um, and then, COVID happened and people counters didn't really make any sense to be the, the forefront of something <laughs> that we were working on. So, um, but now they are because people counters are now also serving as um, uh, occupancy monitoring as well. So not only will we be counting people, you know, for our historical data that we always use and always need, in a temporary sense, we can also use these uh, people counters to communicate not only to us, but the public about where we are in our occupancy as we start to reopen. Um, so for example, um, I don't know if you, some of you might've seen gyms have been doing it right now, but they have something on their website that says like, we're at 25% occupancy. And at that point you can make that decision of, you know, am I comfortable going somewhere that's at 25% occupancy? Um, I can see historically that, you know, it's noon and it's at 25%, but at one o'clock it's at 15%. So I'm going to wait an hour because I really want to go when there's not a lot of people there. Um, so it kind of gives our uh, patrons the freedom to make decisions as well about when's a good time for them to come and visit the library. Um, support wise um, for the staff, um, once occupancy starts to get, so let's say we're at 98% occupancy, I actually will get a text to my phone letting me know that we are at close to our occupancy. And then I can go out on the floor and just make sure there's no nonsense. And it takes some of that pressure off the staff to kind of police. I can be the policeman. Um, they don't need to be the police um, all the time. And I will be... Um, alerted. So I'm sorry, let me just get to present here. And let me just move my Okay. Um, so the benefits to people counters we've talked about last year is, you know, proof of the library's use in funding. Uh, it'll help us create schedules. So 
um, as we start to gather data, I might see that on a regular basis, we're very busy on Thursday nights and we only have three people on on Thursday nights and we're very slow on Monday mornings and we have six people on on Monday morning. So it would make sense to make a change there. So it's gonna optimize our schedule when it comes to staffing so we can um, best use the money that we have. Um, it'll help um, with our program timing and offerings once we're back from, from COVID. Uh, we want to have programs at times that the library is busy in the evening. That would give us an idea that there are adults maybe already in the building um, and have some time to come to a program. So it'll help with that. Um, very long term, it could help with our, you know, uh, research on expanding and renovation. Um, just knowing um, what spaces people are entering, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, when people are coming, what doorway they're using, um, that type of thing. Um, as a future option, I have my proposal is going to be to have um, to get three devices, one for each entrance, and then one for the entrance into the children's room. Um, I think it'll be worth our while to have some information on how many people come into the library and how many of those people then go to the children's room. Um, and it'll also help us with the occupancy in the sense that um, we might be allowing uh, 20 people into the library, um, but if all 20 of those people go into the children's room, we're having a problem. So uh, we might, it might be worth our while to track that, their occupancy in the children's room separate than the rest of the building because it's such a popular place. Yep. Do, do you know, how does it handle, like if um, someone goes into the children's room and then they come out to ask a question at the circ desk and then they go back in. Does it, does it do they get, you know, cause they may get counted twice. Um. Um, so it depends on if we're talking about people counting or occupancy. So occupancy, they would be subtracted out of the room and then added back in. Um, mm -hmm. With people counting, it would it would count them again. So, and, and it would really, be more for occupancy that we because I would I would be interested too in knowing you know that fifty percent of the people who come to the library go to the children's room but it'll be hard to do that if people are going in and out because we won't really have a clear number um, which is it'll too be bad skewed, that, it, it, yeah it will be skewed a little bit but generally um, people don't jump in and out they'll go in and usually stay and come out. If a child like runs out of the room and they're chasing them, they'll come out. Um, yeah. But we have a children's library on, on staff most of the time now because we have Megan D. So there right. would, but you are right. It would be skewed a little bit, but my hope is that it would yeah. give us a general idea. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the real-time occupancy levels. Okay. And so here's a map of our building. I realize the furniture layout's no longer correct, but this is <laughs> the general idea. Um, so we'd like to put a sensor um, going in from the Ripley Road main parking lot and then the Ripley Road's um, uh, main entrance, right? Yeah. And then yeah. the children's room, um, probably beyond the soffit that's in the children's room. Um, and I'll show you the devices. They're very small. And I think they're, they almost look like little Wi-Fi hotspots. And I think they're generally things that you see in buildings now. So it's not a total eyesore. Um, so I've had conversations with the salespeople. And I don't think this is a right, venue, uh, right thing for us right now. But I do find it interesting. So I'm going to share. Um, can you? You probably can't see my mouse, can you? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you can. Your mouse. Lovely. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so, um, so you can create spaces. So we could um, almost track a user's experience. So um, we could um, have um, sensors along the um, area walking into reference. We could have. Um, sensors on the way walking into periodicals so that it would almost give us an idea of um, where this person's, you know, when you come in, where do people go, um, which would be kind of interesting. We could put one um, over the YA area too. Um, if we were a bigger, 
if we were a bigger company and, you know, uh, while that data would be interesting to us and I think relevant, it's very expensive to do. And I just don't think we need it, but it is uh, really interesting that that's something that technology can do now. Do you know if they would lease the equipment so you could do it for a portion of time and get some data? Steve, they do lease the equipment. It's not the equipment that's expensive, as you'll see pretty soon. It's the yearly subscriptions to their softwares that are really the, <laughs> the deal Whoa. breaker. So you can't um, for just a month where you do a sample and then... Maybe I could ask. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a good question. Um, so we reviewed three um, systems. Uh, Traff system and SendSource are both kind of your, uh, I don't wanna say run of the mill, but most standard that you would see um, in a building. We have Traff system right now, which is the beam um, sensor. Uh, so they have, of course, upgraded since the beam, which I think it probably installed maybe 15 years ago. I'm sure you would know all know better than I, but um, so Traff system has, uh, a, it's a video device. It's like a, it's called a 3D, do I have it on here? No, it's called a 3D stereo video sensor. So it's video, but it's very um, analog looking. It's not like a high def uh, video situation. Um, it's ceiling mounted over, um, power over ethernet, which we already have those um, uh, ports installed in the ceiling. We did that work last year. Um, static IP addresses we have already in place. Um, so the annual subscription for all three of the devices is $1,000 and it would be about $4,000 or $4,132 um, to install. Comes with a three, one year warranty. Um, and I did some research on some libraries that they use nearby. Um, and I reached out to Wellesley and Lawrence. Um, I heard back from Wellesley and I did not hear back from Lawrence. And they just said that their experience has been fine. Like uh, there was nothing bad, there was nothing good. They just said it, it was working. So, which is, I guess, a good review. <laughs> Um, then I talked to um, the folks at SendSource. Um, so they also proposed the three sensors for the three spaces. Um, same installation. The cloud subscription is a little bit less expensive. The install was less expensive. The warranty was much better. Um, and their clients are Weymouth and Belmont. And I happen to know the directors there. So I actually um, got to have a... a a little more in-depth conversation and they're very happy with their sensors. Um, no complaints, um, does what they want it to do, haven't had any you know, maintenance issues or needed anybody um, to come out. Um, both Traff system and, no, I'm sorry, just both SendSource and Density, which is um, what I'm about to talk about, do have local technicians. So if there is an issue, they, they will come out to help out. Um, density was the, oops, Sorry. Just had a, a quick question, Megan. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, you know, that these systems, the beam systems were not, you know, high definition, but if, if, you know, is our interest in counting and occupancy or is it also like, is there an additional bonus of security if there's a high def component? Um, so when it comes to security cameras, it's not the cameras that are expensive. It's again, almost the same as this actually. So it's the, um, the house, the server you would need to house all of the uh, video information that comes in. So it, um, you, you have to pay for storage essentially for the data that's coming in from the, from the camera. Um, which is ex fairly expensive. Um, so if this is, you know, 840 for the year, um, just for um, keeping data for just uh, like a low definition uh, people counting, uh, we're looking at some big bucks to have um, a video sensor with keeping the video as well. Um, Will they let you, Megan, um, store it, um, say on Amazon? Or do you have to store it with them? 
No. So it, um, it kind of depends on who they work with. So they create partnerships. Um, so uh, the company that they choose they're going to insure is like extremely secure. Um, so they're not going to use like a cloud from Amazon or, or Apple or something like that. They're looking at companies that this is all that they do is house. Um, Hard to make the argument that, that a company would have better security than Amazon or Apple. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. They make their own partnerships with whoever they decide is, is sure. appropriate. It would be a way of introducing competition so you could, these are ridiculous prices. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, they are. So one device, I mean, one device is like $900 for these little things. And so I'm yeah, thinking more about the end of the Huh? Um, so the last um, company that was really the sparkly, oh, the sparkly shiny company was Density. So they work with big companies like Verizon, uh, MIT, um, the big universities. They're very expensive. Um, they're clearly the best, but I just, I don't think that we need the best. You won't hear me here say that very often, but um, I think that um, I don't like the way that they're mounted. So they have to be now mounted at nine and a half feet. So they have these poles coming down um, to mount the sensors. And it just doesn't, it's very industrial looking. It doesn't fit into our, our look at all. Um, the annual subscription is almost $4,000. Um, it's almost $9,000 to install. Um, it couldn't get a lot of local users. You know, again, I think they're so expensive and they're so involved and the software is so involved that it's really for really large spaces. Chicago Public Library. Oh, I thought something said. Um, so I just, while it was shiny, sparkly and fantastic, I just don't think it's for us. Um, so I, I, had a conversation with Ron um, Menard about what his thoughts were and his thoughts were the same as mine. Um, we really liked SenSource. Um, we're hoping to move forward with them. Um, this money was budgeted in our um, municipal appropriated budget this year. Um, so it's still, we still have plenty of money in that technology account. Um, so I think it's visually pleasing. It's just a white, tiny little, not tiny, but it's a white box and it really blends into what we have already. I don't think people would notice it as an eyesore. Um, the reporting is standard. It has the occupancy moder monitoring that I would really like to have. Um, the cost um, that they gave us also has the occupancy monitoring and they said, you know, within the year or two, hopefully, as we all hope, um, that we won't need it anymore that um, price will drop a little bit. Um, I think it's affordable compared to some of its competitors. I loved their customer service. I thought they were really on top of things. They always got back to me right away. Um, and they, we had a conversation about making a change to the quote and it was done within minutes. Um, their references were great and the install is going to be fairly easy. Um, so I would like um, for the trustees to to vote and move to um, install the sensors pupil counters. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, of course. What's the time frame on this? Um, so uh, right away, <laughs> because we would really like this to be done uh, before we reopen, which will is is coming soon. Soon. Ooh. Good news. Yes. <laughs> Next topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, and if not, uh, could we please have a motion to go forward with um, the sensor? Is that the right name? Um, with Megan's, we'll just say with Megan's recommendation. I move so moved. we accept Megan's reputation. Uh, reputation. <laughs> <and recommendation. laughs> That's good too. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Okay, we'll do a, a roll call vote. Um, Megan, can you please stop sharing so I can see everyone? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, so we will do, we'll do uh, one by one. I'll do it the same way we did for, um, for attendance. 
Uh, Carolyn Coffey, aye. Um, Sarah? Pease, yes. Megan B? Megan Brinsey, aye. Steve? Steve Brown, aye. Lynn? Oh, you got to unmute. <laughs> Linda Giacomo, aye. Elaine? Elaine Breslow, aye. Mary Lou? Lawrence, aye. Catherine? Catherine O'Callaghan, aye. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's good. Catherine Harvey, aye. So you, I think, I don't think I missed anyone. Uh, so unanimous approval, go forward and conquer. <laughs> Yay, thank you. That's great. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, creating a, I'm going to reshift my screen again, um, creating an outdoor story time or a programming area in general for the spring. Um, I've worked with the staff. We've identified this space on Sawyer. Um, Sawyer Street is the best location. Um, it's still going to be a little bit noisy, but it's large enough for what we need it to be. And um, um, we think it provides a nice space. There's a little hill that could be a little stage. Um, there's a lot of different options of kind of fun things that we can do with this space. Um, our only concern with this space is uh, the the fact that there's a busy road there and we don't want any um, little ones to get on the move and kind of get out to the street. So we have some friends money left over from our programming um, that we intend on asking them if we can just use um, to outfit this uh, story um, or this programming space. Um, so what I'm asking the trustees tonight is to um, discuss um, two fencing options for kind of the look of how it's going to be. And I'm happy to go look for some other options. These are the two that I felt were the best. Um, they're, you know, um, they're about 18 inches. No, I'm sorry. They're both 21 and a half inches high. Um, so it gives us a good border. Um, I'm not trying to, you know, um, you know, really fence everybody in, but I'm just trying to uh, create a border, uh, kind of like just a safety border, if you will. Um, so I didn't know if there was uh, a fence that everybody liked more than another, or if you'd like me to keep looking. Um, the cost to do this is about between $350 and $400. Um, it's temporary fencing. So what this is, is it's actually garden fencing. <laughs> so, um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. I realize that it's not uh, the normal decor of what we have out front. So I just wanted to have a conversation about what we, what our thoughts were. So why, why is it um, temporary? Uh, Lynn, we'd like to have story times out there specifically. And what yeah. we're Learned about is the kids running to the like the main road, right? So but, but you mean when you say temporary, you don't see how long do you see having it up? Um, I don't until we start to have story times inside. I guess. Oh, um, okay, okay. So it's not something that you would want to use for going forward, even when you can be inside. Outdoor no, space. I think if we're going to do something like that, if we're going to do something more permanent, I'd really like to try to work out the space that's the courtyard that has those awful um, AC units. Uh -huh. um, you know, looking for a grant to try to get some type of sound buffer or something. I really think that's the best spot, but those AC units are so loud that um, for something that we need to put together fairly quickly, it's just not a great space that's going to work out, but you know, someday I would love to put together a really nice dynamic program space in that area. Um, but kind of time is of the essence, I guess, um, for this particular thing. So Megan, my question is, I'm not quite understanding, is are you proposing that this that temporary fencing go straight across, so, you know, parallel to Sawyer or in a circle, or I'm not really envisioning how large a space this would encompass that would be enclosed. 
Sure. Sorry, I kind of skipped that part. So um, what I, I, the way that we see it is having this fencing um, follow the inside edge of the walkway that's already there. So there's a kind of a natural uh, line that goes through our property here. Um, so we hope to follow it, um, fence off the parking lot where these signs are here and then follow the line of the pathway on the inside um, up to um, more of the Ripley Road area. So it's like an L shape. Yeah. Uh, Megan, tell me a little bit about your timeline. Are, are you anticipating doing these reading groups like now? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but as soon as the weather gets nice. So we really want to start, you know, reopening, having programming again. Um, and we want to create spaces to be able to do that. Um, the Children's Department put together a spreadsheet of how many people generally come to their programs um, and how much space, if we needed to be six feet apart, uh, we would need to be able to accommodate those people. And it was a pretty large space. Um, I don't actually think we're achieving that, uh, but so the bigger the space we can create out here, the better. We don't want to turn people away. I, I don't know what the regulations are going to be, so that's a little hard, um, but I'm going with our the knowledge that I have from what we've been through already, and it seems like the six feet apart outside is going to kind of be our next um, step. Um, that we'll be able to achieve when it comes to our programming. So, so it, I it, guess it's that's, not just yeah. story time. It, it's also like mama stuff and puppet shows and all that kind. Of, it's it's any kind of programming, children's right? programming. Yes, that's what I should be saying. Yes, all children's programming. And, and so, we would like to do our adult programming out here. We wouldn't need as big of a space, but we'd love to have our book groups come back and be meeting here, you know, um, or you know, wherever it fits um, and it's appropriate, we'd love to start seeing people in person being able to have programs here. So is your expectation that throughout the summer you will not gather in the library, you'll be gathering outside? That's what I would assume, yes. Megan, will this area be tented um, just with the hot summer? <laughs> No. There's enough. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, I think, Megan, that's a great idea for a more permanent outdoor space, which, you know, is something I think is going to take a lot of planning and um, some grant funding and, and things like this, but, um, and probably some more talks about where it could be, but we're kind of in like a last minute dash right now to um, get some type of space outdoors that's going to work for us. I'm not sure that those fencing are going to contain somebody for a long period. Uh, you know, I, I think that you're right in the temporary, but I'm not sure if you're going to use them through August that they, that may serve. It looks more like a uh, border than it does an enclosure, like to keep kids in. Megan, can you scroll down again so that we can see? I was also curious about the dimensions, like the height and so forth. I can if look those. Oh, I have, have them in that book. Um, so they're, uh, uh, let me double check here. Um, so if they're 21 inches. <laughs> right, they're 21 inches high. Um, you know, they're not meant to, uh, for lack of better wording, be the parent, you That's know? So it's really just meant to be a border, um, almost like a visual, sorry, I'm trying to. 21 inches is about mid thigh on me. So it's, it's meant to be like Megan was just about to say, a, a visual to keep the kids so that they know that there's a boundary there. There still will be plenty just of space a cue, for them in to other move words. around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and a cue for parents as well. Like anything beyond this is starting to get to be not, you, you need to go get your child. <laughs> um, they or could not. for nanny. That, that's, I have a question about that just from a legal perspective. I just wonder if I, if, if it, if I believe that it's being represented to me that this is a safe space. And I understand I have a responsibility for my child. 
The fact that it runs, you know, as an L and there's still, you know, some access to the parking lot and maybe rec and drop-offs might be happening at the same time, or I don't know, you know, are, do I think the library is being negligent and not really enclosing properly the entire area? Or like, is the representation that there's a border possibly suggesting that there's more protection there than there really is? And are we exposed for anything for that reason for, with some religious person that decides you told me there was a, I saw the fence and, you know, I, it, I well, thought I would, and in, in addition to what Elaine is saying, I would also ask, could a child running at that fence, knock it over? Probably. Yeah. If they pushed hard enough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. most garden fencing, a child, even a, a small child can just plow right, right through. Um, I will say from my experience with fencing, that is the cheapest um, estimate I've ever seen. It, it must be, you know, fairly flimsy to be able to do it for that cost, for that amount of fencing, for that money. But it's just garden fencing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's from Amazon. It is probably fairly flimsy. You know, again, it's not... Oh, meant it's to secure an area. It's not meant to do anything but serve as a visual border um, so that we don't, so that everybody understands like where the space is. Um, and we don't have people, you know, trying to go beyond that and listening to story time. The price is low enough so that if it turns out it doesn't work, you're not wasting a huge amount. I mean, you can see how well it works. Yeah, I mean, it's really only meant to be getting us through August. Um, you know, again, this is very temporary. If we were getting to somewhere that we wanted it to be more uh, an ongoing uh, permanent thing, which I would absolutely love, I just think it's going to take us some more time and research and and um, and you know, working groups to huh and investment. Yes, to because we'll create. want we'll want to do something nice that's in keeping with the building and that's not necessarily on Sawyer Street where you're going to hear the traffic. Um, right. But I, I think this is a a good suggestion. I think that um, ideally you'll have the performers down at the bottom of the hill so that people can sit on the hill like it's an amphitheater, and as a result, you know, you'll have the children, you know, the 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 performer will be in front of the more dangerous areas and the children will be behind. Um, but uh, so I, I, I love the idea and, um, and I, I would like to think that it's the visual cue would be enough and that hopefully parents will take responsibility and that maybe in the beginning of every program that needs to be an announcement. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Just announce it to the parents that, you know, you're, you are responsible for your children. Yeah. And, you know, you would all be surprised of kind of, you know, another thing we could try doing it without and just seeing kind of what the behaviors are. And then if we decide that we need the fencing for a visual, um, we can go ahead and order it then. Um, I'm just trying to be... Um, um, active think, what towards we, what we think will probably happen. What What if we just got like I used to have these? Um, in fact, I may still have them. These little miniature orange cones that you know, you could just set up little cones for the same visual cue, and then you pick them up after the program every time, and you don't have to have this fence around there, and they cost nothing. They're like you know part of kid toys. I mean, sure, yeah, I just, I was concerned. I was working hard on making sure that the visual, it was visually pleasing, um, but if they're coming up and coming down, um, we can try that. That's, a, that's an option. I, I, just sort of going back to what, to what Elaine was saying, if, if you put something out that's in, inadequate, you have to sort of consider the fact that you know, are, are you taking on any duties as a result of the representations that you're making? So yes, it's a visual cue, but are you suggesting, I, I, I 
actually prefer your idea of trying it without because then the mm -hmm. risk is manifest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good point. Um, another thing we thought about is like putting out hula hoops for kids to sit in. So like maybe that would act as you know, a boundary for them enough that they feel like they need to stay in their hula hoop. I don't know, but yeah. All right. We because can try it out and see how it goes. I mean, I'd rather not spend the money on cheap thing that looks, <laughs> <You know, laughs> and, and just, I want to be clear. I wasn't uh, balking at the cost at all. Um, but I also you know, the height of these fences are toddler height. So some kid runs and trips and impales themselves on a cheap, I, I just, it just, to me, just seems like it's something potentially. Mm -hmm. not I agree. As, as oh. risk, just different risks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, it's not the money. It's I love and I oh God, if we could build a patio with a stone wall around the oh, whole thing. Amazing. And that, that'd be great. Um, have like those um not like the tent, but like the um colored um overhangs that come through that look almost like sails. Um yeah. yeah. Someday, maybe. <laughs> Okay, we'll go ahead without. And, you know, if we find that we're having an issue, we will reconvene. Okay. Um, next. I'll, look, I'll look for my little cones and I can, at you can at least kind of set them up a little bit too. Yeah. If you, at if least you want. maybe to start with too, just to when people are coming in, feel comfortable about where their choice of spot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the hula hoops would help with that too. The hula hoops are a great idea. Yeah, it's the same thing like when the kids were little, they would each get a little uh, carpet square to sit on yeah. in class. Yeah. And that's, that was your, and yeah. now with COVID, those kids know. I mean, that's what they're doing in the nursery school and kindergarten. and Or just tell people to bring a beach towel. Yeah. Yeah. That's their spot. Um, the other thing you could potentially do is just put a rope. You know, if you want, if you're trying to delineate spots. Mm -hmm. Just get a, a long piece of rope. Yep. Yeah. If you want. Anyway. Okay. All um, right. We'll try without with hula hoops. That sounds good. All right. Um, next, just reporting on Pride Month and Juneteenth. We've been asked by um, Carrie Thompson um, to join in the crew um, to create a um, kind of a community-wide uh, week of events, which we're very excited about. So we've been chatting a little bit about some of the things that we could do as the library, um, one of them being a lecture about pronouns, which I think would be very interesting to a lot of people. It seems to be um, sometimes a point of confusion on how to properly address somebody. Um, and I'm sure everybody wants to um, do it correctly. And um, so it's a great, um, that'll be great. That's by a gender studies teacher, uh, professor at Boston University. Uh, the other thing we're exploring is binary flags. Um, again, because we just don't know where we're going to be um, in this pandemic, we would like to have something outdoors um, that people can um, enjoy as well if they don't feel comfortable coming into the library. Um, so I didn't know this, but there are non-binary non flags. My um, youth services um, assistant librarian told us about this. Um, so um, having the flags up and displaying kind of what they mean and where they come from. Can you tell me what they are? <laughs> yeah, so they represent um, the, um, the LGBTQ community. So there's a flag oh, okay. for um, each group and um, and uh, which I had no idea. So if I don't know, I'm sure, you know, a lot of people don't know um, about these flags. So having them displayed with um, kind of their meetings um, and having that as kind of an outdoor exhibit was an idea that was thrown around. Um, we would like to probably do something outdoors uh, just so it can be um, part of the community as people drive by our location as well. Um, so when that comes a little bit closer, I will chat with you all about it. Um, I just didn't want it to come up in any other of your meetings and you don't, you didn't know what they were talking about and you were blindsided. So um, there are just, there are conversations going on about doing something outdoors at the library. Um, and when 
we decide what that is and what we would like it to look like, we will come and chat with you about it. It's interesting, major universities are doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's it's time. Um, it's something that Hingham, I guess, has done over the last couple of years. And so we're feeling a little behind um, because we are. And we would like to um, start something this year that we can create as an annual um, an annual event. Uh, we're also looking at Juneteenth. Um, we, have, we are going to be a part of it. We would like to do some programming towards it. We're still kind of um, playing with some ideas there. Um, so we will have some Juneteenth programming, but we're just not quite sold on what we want to do. And if any of you have any ideas, we'd be happy to take them. Um, and then very lastly, on a light, a little bit later, um, Chris Sr. Uh, agreed to um, fund uh, a certificate in digital marketing for me um, from the University of Vermont. Um, I'm already about a quarter of the way through it, and I'm really enjoying it. And OCLN nominated me to be part of their executive board, uh, which is very exciting. And I've never served on the executive board before. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, very lastly, I was called today just for, again, kind of on your radar, something that's coming up that there hasn't been any decisions made or recommendations to be made quite yet. But I was contacted today about the fact that town hall is going to be going through a renovation um, fairly soon after COVID, they're saying post COVID. Um, and that if we had any space in the library that could be offices um, for about 18 months, um, I think we do have spaces. They wanted our study rooms, which unfortunately just, I don't think that's a great space. Um, but I think we have some other spaces up um, in the safe harbor area has some rooms off, um, um, off the, the larger room. Um, I think my office is pretty big and I'm happy to share it with somebody. Um, I think maybe our historical room could be used a little bit as well. So I do think there's some options. I would like to be a team player on this. Um, I welcome any feedback, um, but uh, you know, it's temporary, it's only 18 months. And you know, if we can help kind of get this town hall <laughs> done and, <laughs> and um, help everybody be productive while their spaces are being worked on. I think that would be a really great thing. So it is going to be a little bit of an inconvenience to us for a little while, but you know, 18 months is, I don't think a big deal. But it's not going to be 18 months. That's the first thing, but okay. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's it's true. Never no, nor is it going to start as quickly as they like to think. Correct. Just saying. Yeah. Not yeah. that I have any insider information or anything. <laughs> and it won't end up being the cost either. I hope that's from my experience at Randolph. I think it's wonderful that you guys are working to help the town. I think not only is it what you should do, but I think it'll also be very pragmatic in terms of your ability to get future support. I think it'll help us build relationships too. So one of my goals this year, I haven't had my review yet, but one of my goals I wrote down in my review is to start uh, networking. So my first year was first year and then my second year has been COVID. So I really haven't met anybody around town and I really haven't met anybody in town hall. Um, so I'm looking forward to this year and, and um, years moving forward to build some more relationships with folks in town and build some more relationships with folks in town hall because it is going to benefit us um, if we have relationships. And I think it'd be great for the staff too to meet their their colleagues at Town Hall, even if it's just a few of them. Um, but it would be nice to build some relationships there, I think, not only for me, but the entire staff. That's awesome. So, well, thank um, you and congratulations on your OCLN appointment. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, if, uh, do you have anything else you want to add or should we move on to the bills? Move on. Thank you. All right. Um, Bronwyn, is there anything that we need to know? Yeah, I was just looking it over. I don't see a lot that uh, stands out any different than what we usually have. Um, the Historical Society, as you probably have guessed, is for the, uh, the 250 book that uh, Gail really wanted to have in our collection. Um, you know, we're renewing some things. We did renew the Children's Museum, even though they're not open right now, but they should be opening shortly. And 
actually, when I was leaving today, uh, Janet mentioned that next week is um, school vacation week and she had a couple of calls for people who wanted to uh, use our museum passes. So even surprisingly in the middle of the pandemic, people still uh, want to go to the aquarium or children's museum or MFA or any of those uh, the museums that are open. So uh, I think it's important that we do keep those passes and uh, a few of the museums have been giving us credit for when they've been closed so that it extends our, our um, membership. So um, other than that, I think that's pretty straightforward. I did mention in my report that our, um, the endowment funds did go in to the account. So we've got plenty of money to purchase things. So uh, Good question, what was, the, what was the glitch? Oh, um, it was really more to do with the um, the other donation that we got. Um, a couple of people in the treasurer's office get confused when we get a donation, especially if it's to the CLT. They tend to put it in our account that we can um, use to spend, and it's really only supposed to be invested. It's not um, it's not our funds to to use. Uh, that's only the takeout that we get every year. So um, they had to take it out of one account, put it in another, and that sort of thing. So it's, um, and then it did take a while to, to actually do the transfer because it takes two people from the treasurer's office to uh, do the, the transfer. And uh, one person, I believe, had been exposed to COVID. So she was out for a couple of weeks. So just, Typical. Yeah. Okay, nothing. No, no missing money or anything like that. So okay. <laughs> it was all good. <laughs> but uh, it's nice to be able to keep on top of it and oh. actually log into Software and see it there. So um, I was happy about that. So, um, but that's it. Unless anyone has any other questions, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you had uh, Megan. You had. Um mentioned at our last meeting or maybe even two meetings ago that um, you were gonna negotiate with the Christmas lights people um, and get the price down a little bit because we didn't get all the lights that were originally on the contract. Did that ever happen? Yeah, so we're working on a letter at this point um, because they've not returned any emails or calls since, um, since the conversation, which I'm really sad about. Um, they have great reviews. So, you know, I was going to jump online and see what I could do there, but they have about 400 fabulous reviews on Google. So one bad review is not going to do anything. So um, Raman and I are working on a strong worded letter. Um, and then I'm going to kind of get Christina involved and see what he has to say, because unfortunately they're no longer answering me. No, well, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Thanks for trying. We're going to keep trying, <laughs> yeah. but um, it's extremely unfortunate and upsetting. So I'm not, I, I kind of thought it, we were waiting to the end of their season, but it's been well after the end of their season and they've received multiple calls and emails. So. Gotcha. Um, were there any other questions or comments on the bills? And if not, could I have a motion to approve? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Um, all in favor, we'll do the roll call again. Uh, Carolyn Coffey, aye. Uh, Catherine O. Uh, Catherine O'Callaghan, aye. Catherine H. Aye. Steve. Steve Brown, aye. Lynn. Linda Giacomo, aye. Megan B. Megan Brinsey, aye. Sarah. Sarah Pease, aye. Elaine. Elaine Breslow, aye. Mary Lou. Lawrence, aye. Uh, so the bills pass unanimously. Um, uh, and Bronwyn, I will come in and sign that tomorrow, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's actually on Megan's chair. She has to just initial everything, but every, um, it's all good to go. Um, okay, so I'll come in tomorrow afternoon. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. And um, And then just trying to remember the agenda off the top of my head. Um, I don't have a report, sadly. Um, 
the CLT did meet last night. Uh, it too is quiet. Um, we do have uh, two people at least rolling off um, come May. And um, both Jane Gertica and Patience Toll, both of whom hit a demographic and have were um, trying to lead the charge on our development efforts when we were doing development, um, which of course has been tabled for the last year. But um, we will want to find some people um, to help in that um, in that effort once we get kind of past some of the COVID stuff. So if you guys have any suggestions for people you think um, might be willing to serve, it's a very light load, um, but we will need to um, look for a couple of more people. Um, other than that, the uh, uh, investment committee met and um, the uh, endowment performed um, exceptionally well in the fourth quarter and our balance is about $2 million right now. Great. Um, so, uh, so that's a pretty exciting milestone and, you know, knock on wood, it, uh, it keeps climbing for us. Um, but it sounds like everyone's doing an excellent job. So that's about it for the CLT. Um, friends, Catherine? We had a meeting last week. Um, our appeal is up to um, just over 28,000, well, 28,644. Um, which puts us about four grand over this time last year. Um, yeah, so like we were saying last month, that was not necessarily, obviously not expected. And um, so, but very much welcome. Um, so we added another $2,500 in, in January. And um, only other notable discussion was, um, and Carolyn, you'll, <laughs> you'll appreciate this, we settled on the date for our book collection as uh, Sunday, March 21st. <laughs> so we wanted yes. to sort of, yeah, we wanted to maybe do it in the spring when it's, you know, sort of a more appropriate time for that. And we can be outside, hopefully. Um, although I think we're probably going to end up maybe using the community room or some space. And we may also do a collection or at least some promoting and signage at the dump. So, uh, so the 21st Sunday, I think we're doing one to four. So if you have books that are accumulating good books, the good ones, we want the good ones, <laughs> then hold on to them until March 21st. And that's about I, it. I was just weeding, I was just weeding out. So I'll hold those, that bag. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, did that, I, sorry. No, I was just um, going to say, I just wanted, have anything else? Oh, sorry. I just want to interject real quick because I forgot that I received an email from Carol St. Pierre today, and there are three trustees up for re-election, Megan Brinzi, Lynn DiGiacomo, and Catherine Harvey. And so you need to, I'll email you, there's an intention form to fill out that I can email you um, if you would like to be re-nominated or re-elected. -re Megan, can I ask a question? How does that work with COVID and getting uh, signatures? Question. That's a great question. I have no idea. I was, I was I will figure the that same out for thing. You. Yeah, I know um, that papers just came out yesterday, but I, I honestly don't know what the town has said. Carolyn, do you? No, I don't. Town. I know um, town hall opens um, the 16th, so um, you can pull papers then. Uh, but I would shoot an email to um, Carol St. Pierre and maybe CC the other two trustees and uh, just lob out the question and, and or and or Beth Anderson um, in her office because uh, they, they can let you know. And they have a they have a form online, too, that if you don't want to go to town hall, I think you can you can just print it off and sign it and drop it off. Or I don't think you can fill it in online, but you know, I don't think you have I was to actually the physically signatures. go. No, right, for sure, for the signatures, but for the actual nomination papers, I don't think you have to go in, in person if, if that's inconvenient. Keep me posted. This, I'd love to know this what is the a answer good is. Year, this is a good year to run if you don't have to get the signatures, just yeah. FYI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
dad might run. <laughs> Maybe we can run early. <laughs> Yeah, that that's hard because I used to bring them to like my meetings, you know, like right. and you know you could bang out twenty signatures in one in one sitting. That's yeah. that's tough. I guess you have to like post yourself at the dump for a while. <laughs> what about uh, emails with um, authorized signatures? Uh, that's a good question, Steve. Okay. I will, you know, we'll find out. I guess what the town requir requirements will be. Because there's a select board spot open this year too. So, you know, I'm sure it's, and school committee. I mean, I guess there probably are in every election, but in any event, I'm sure that they've settled on something. So we'll just have to find out what it is. <clears throat> is there anything else that um, anyone wanted to talk about tonight that wasn't otherwise on the agenda? I, I wanted to just say one thing quickly. I was in another meeting in, in town last week and, um, Someone in the meeting expressed just mild frustration, but she was trying to get a title that she wanted to read because she was reflecting about Black History Month. And it was a fairly, I mean, it was, it was an accessible, what I would think of being as an accessible title. Maybe it's been in demand in any way. So she had to wait. And she had said that she had looked for a couple of other titles and that, that weren't in our circulation and within the network. And it was just, sort of a lengthy process for her to get to some of the titles that she was thinking about. And then I was really, so I have some regret that I didn't think about anything in time for us to set something up this year. And I would like it if maybe we could think about it in the fall or, um, oh, sorry, I just lost my video. Hold on. <laughs> there you we are. Have you. <laughs> my phone rang. Um, you know, that if, just to sort of start the conversation for next year, because I would love it if we could, you know, if, if maybe set aside a small part of the materials budget or whatever, whatever buying we might be doing in December or January, if we could maybe be rolling out some fresh titles um, in time for February or maybe doing like a read along a week or, or whatever, a read along for the month or something to align with Black History Month. And I, I'm wishing that I had thought of that in time for us to do it this year, but in any event, just getting it started for next year. I just want to make uh, sure that we're also meeting whatever demands we have in that area um, for the, you know, for the patrons who are looking for those titles, fiction and nonfiction. So was it that it wasn't in the network at all or that it was taking too long to get to them? Yeah, it was in the network. Yeah, it was in the network. This one particular title that she said it was in the network and it did it, you know, and it, it, that could be attributable to any one of a number of factors for sure. Um, but it just, for me, elicited the question, do we have the titles on hand in our circulation to meet those needs? Is it possible to do short-term leasing of title? Like, can we can we have you know ten copies that we do for three months or something like that to to cover that? Because I'm sure it may have been related to Black History Month. So people are like, oh well, what's a current thing that I can read? You know, to make me feel like I'm you know part of this. And um, and so everyone's looking for that title at that time. I don't know if you have to lease the books for um, for a year or whether you could do a, a shorter term? Um, so we have a fairly robust lease program that we utilize um, that we switch out things monthly. Um, so we have a kind of a monthly swap over. Um, Black History Month. So there are a few, I'm gonna say there's about 10 really hot titles right now um, when it comes to like how to be an anti-racist. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of them and they're very, very, very popular right now. Um, kind of this I think is probably going in hand in hand with the complaint that we've been getting all through COVID. Um, everyone's quarantining materials. So anything that's coming in through transit is taking forever. Um, so to get things right now is very difficult and our things are going out as well. So even if it's something that we own, um, Essentially, it goes into transit, it goes to another library, it sits at the other library for three days before it's checked out to a patron. 
The patron brings it back. It gets quarantined again for three days. Then it comes to Cohasset and is quarantined yet again for three days. So um, moving things between libraries has been an absolute nightmare. This was a study that was done um, called the Realm Study. And I'm trying to remember who conducted it. Um, I'd have to double check. We had talked about it very early in the pandemic. And this is the standard that they have set for circulating items between libraries. And I, I've received lots of complaints. People are really annoyed. It's actually one of the reasons why we launched book bundles because we could grab things that were in-house to suit people's needs um, because people were waiting so long for especially popular items. Um, but I do agree with you. It would be great if we could stock up on um, items um, like this, especially for Black History Month, but they have been popular pretty much since March, um, as you might imagine. So the movement of materials has been extremely poor. Um, and we don't, so normally we have our lease items as a, a no hold item. So when there is browsing, people can come in and just grab them, but it doesn't make sense right now to have items that have no holds. Um, so, um, so everything is circulating. Um, and I would agree uh, with your, your, your friend or your, your meeting mate that um, things are coming very slowly and it is frustrating for sure. Good, thank you. Is there anything else? If I know we're running kind of late. I just wanted to highlight another resource very, very briefly that I think is appropriate for a library. Um, we all look into the same building, but we look in through different windows. And when we're meeting with folks who happen to have a very different window, it's useful to know what their perspective is. And it's a resource called All Sides. And if you'll let me share my uh, screen, I can just in about a minute show you the, some of the key things. Um, and it's, it's something that if other people feel is appropriate, I think it should be added to our website. It's basically a website that presents, uh, you can do a keyword search on key issues and it will present how um, conservative this medias is, uh, report that, how liberal medias report it. And it has uh, a section for uh, children, teenagers, it's really a very powerful resource. Um, I did give you permission to share your screen. Okay, I don't know great. If I need to do it. So anything. hopefully, can you see that? Yep. Yes. yes. Great. So um, for example, take impeachment, which is ongoing. You can see how um, different groups I don't know if you can see this, news from the left, news from the center, news from the right. So as you're talking with someone in your family or friends who may look through a different window, you can read what they're reading and get uh, some perspective on where they're coming from. Then there's a um, wonderful program for kids to help them understand it. I think we've all had questions from kids, you know, what is all this about? So. It's called All Sides, and um, it's, a, it's a great resource. So that was what I wanted to show. And I've actually been using it in some of my discussions, and it's been very useful. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else? And if not, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second? second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you for your.